Hi, my name is Sara Plasencia and today I feel truly honored to have this conference with the film producer Daniel Conrad Cooper. Many thanks for accepting the invitation, Daniel. Welcome. Hi, Sara. Thank you so much for having me. I'm very excited to talk to you and to be helping Barcelona International Film Festival today. What I'm going to talk about over the course of the next hour is a little bit about having a breadth of experience and how understanding lots of different departments actually makes me better at my job as a producer. In terms of the more understanding I have of what makes an art department tick, what a camera department cares about, what a sound department cares about, enables me to better budget, better schedule and better manage the people in all of those different departments. So yeah, so I started out right at the bottom and have gradually developed my experience working my way up the ladder. Uh, and I think that's been really valuable. And it's also a case of not always continuing to step up the ladder. Sometimes it's two steps forward, one step back. And so while I am a producer and I have produced uh, now 10 feature films, um, I still work on other people's films in different capacities, sometimes as a line producer, a production manager or a first AD. And if there are times when I'm not working, if somebody needs a runner on their set or needs some help, I'm very quick to volunteer for that stuff because it's only through working on other people's projects and working on projects that you build your contact network and you uh, build your experience. And that helps me um, make my next projects better. So I started out, as I said, as an assistant on these big studio movies. Now, studio movies have hundreds and hundreds of crew involved with them. Um, these films will, each of them have had budgets of sort of 50 to 150 million dollars. They employ between, you know, 300 and 600 people at any given time. But your role on one of these big films is a very small cog in a big machine. You'll have heard that um, expression. And by that, I mean, you have one very dedicated task that you have to fulfill. And you don't necessarily get a lot of creative input in these projects beyond that. And so these are, are great ways to learn and great ways to understand. But the way that a studio movie is made is completely different, not completely different, but is very different um, in terms of, of how it comes together and how problems are solved to an independent movie. And most of you guys will start your careers uh, or develop your careers in independent film. And that should really be, I think, the focus of our talk over this next hour is how to get your own films going, because it's all very well wanting to make the next Captain America or Avengers movie. But realistically, there's a lot of steps you have to go through before you're at a, a level in your uh, career progression where people are going to start considering you for these bigger budget things. So um, of these films, Stardust, I was a PA and a runner, and I looked after the director, who's a guy called Matthew Vaughan. Um, I then got very lucky. I fell in with an American producer, a guy called Jake Myers, and I was his assistant uh, for a couple of films in the UK. And then he took me out to Canada, where we worked on the films like uh, Red and Total Recall. Um, and out there, I had a bit of a USP. And this is something that becomes quite useful. A USP stands for a unique selling point. And that means you have something a bit different to everyone else. And I, I'm going to really be encouraging uh, everyone to think about their USP, what you have to offer that maybe other people don't. When I was out in Canada, I was this British guy. So although they just needed somebody to help out on set as, a, as an assistant, by being a bit different, by having uh, literally a different accent, but also different film credits and different experience to the other people around, that meant that I was a bit more memorable. Uh, when projects came around, they were like, oh, we should hire that British guy, he's nice. Um, and making a good impression on people, everyone you work with, whether you're working with somebody who's working as a runner or working as an accountant or working as a, a, a cinematographer, everybody that you ever work with in the film industry is somebody who might get you another job because all those people, all of um, the crew of one film are all gonna go on to different films after that. And different films are gonna need to plug all sorts of different gaps. And it's very common that film jobs or jobs on film sets are not advertised. They're recruited through word of mouth and people will ask the team, hey, has anybody worked with anyone who can do this or who can do that? 
And if you've got on well with people and you've made a good impression, work breeds work. And for me, I've been very lucky because I worked on some big films to start with. I made a good impression on some people. Almost all of the work that I've had over the last 15 years has been people calling me saying, hey, do you want to come and work on this thing? So really think about it. And it's not just the senior people who hire because it might be somebody who worked as uh, a runner on a short film that you worked on. That runner then might go and be a producer's assistant on a big studio movie. And that person might be able to help you get a break. So don't just be nice uh, to the higher ups and the chiefs. Think about everybody on a film set and think about what everybody thinks of you, whatever your job is. So then I continued to work in production. I also worked in the camera department as a camera trainee and as a video playback operator through these films, um, working with uh, Tommy Lee Jones as his assistant on Captain America. But yeah, as I said, studio movies are a really different beast to independent movies. When we think about what a film is, a studio movie often has a lot more money and a lot bigger stars. Um, and so therefore a studio movie is, um, is able more often to make films about events, about big things. So if uh, we were thinking about a film in which an enormous tidal wave crashes through London, destroying a bunch of buildings, the studio movie would show us that. We would see this tidal wave coming in. We would see lots of damage. We would see lots of people running away. An independent movie on the scale of budgets that we often work at is not gonna be able to tell that story in the same way. It doesn't mean that we can't tell that story. We've just gotta be clever about how we tell that story. So the independent version of that is maybe the story of two people who've survived a tidal wave that's hit London. It's two people hiding out um, in the aftermath of some destruction. It's a much smaller cast. It's a much more contained approach to a story. Whereas studios can show us the thousands of tanks or the hundreds of orcs, you know, climbing over a hill, uh, the independent movie has to focus much more on people. And this is something that I would really stress is that what independent movies can do really well and what doesn't cost a lot of money is telling stories about people and characters and how people respond to events. So the studio movies are about the events and are about the spect spectacle, whereas the independent movies are much more commonly about people's reactions to events. And that's how we can generate an emotive response. We can get people to emotionally engage with characters and people. So that's studio and independent movies. So where will your career begin? Um, I know that some of you have already begun making films, but it's important to think about the fact that actually your career is likely to begin in the independent movie sector. So it might, you might be the biggest fan of the Avengers and the Marvel movies and um, big spectacle stuff, the Christopher Nolan films, but those are really not the films that you're gonna make first. It's really important that you guys consider the independent movies and watch independent movies and watch short movies because that is your competition and that is the standard that you're trying to get to in order to get picked up to be considered for those bigger films. So think about your next, step, next steps. Watch lower budget projects to see what they're doing well. And sometimes you watch an independent movie and it's a disaster and things haven't gone well. But think about why it hasn't worked out because everybody who works on a film wants it to be really good. So if the final product isn't very good, why do you think that's happened? And quite often you can watch a film and see that they didn't have enough money for this or for that. And my job as a producer is really about establishing consistency across a film. Because if a film is brilliant, but the sound is terrible, then ultimately the film is terrible because a film is only as good as its weakest part. And if you make an awesome film and the costumes look awful, then everybody will just remember it as a film in which the costumes looked awful. You're never gonna make people think that your film was awesome if there's one department that's letting everything down. So it's much more important. And when you're managing a project, my job as a producer is to make sure that every department is at the right standard. Now, that doesn't mean that every department has loads of money. Obviously, you've got to manage how much money you apportion to each element in your film, and every film has different requirements. 
but it's really worth thinking about that consistency uh, and not just consistency between departments, also consistency between scenes. Because it's really easy to spend a lot of money on one really awesome scene in your movie. But if there's one scene that's awesome and the rest of the film looks a little bit cheap, then overall the experience of watching your film is not going to be fulfilling and you're not going to get into the festivals you want to, you're not going to get the awards, it's not going to help kick on your career. So do think about that and do watch other people's movies as a good example of what else is on out there, what other people are doing well, but also what they're doing badly. So how did I become a producer? I told you that I started out as a runner. I started out working on these big films. How did I move from crewing on other people's movies to managing my own projects? Well, it's been quite a gradual process. And as I said, it's been two steps forward, one step back. So I've been continuing to work on other people's movies to pay myself money and in order to pay my rent every month. Just because I've worked on lots of films doesn't mean I'm super rich, unfortunately. Not yet, still working on that. Um, but yeah, so I work on other people's projects to help fund my life. And then I'm developing all the time my own projects to get them going so that when I've got enough money saved up or when I've got the right pieces coming together, I can then get my own projects into action. But I realized pretty early on that um, I realized pretty early on that people weren't going to give me a job that I hadn't done before. And this is a real problem across any freelance community. And it's something worth uh, everyone thinking about. Like, why would somebody give me a job rather than someone else? And so when I was starting out, I realized that no one was going to hire me as a producer until I had produced some stuff. So I realized that I had to give myself that opportunity. And whether you're a director, a cinematographer, whatever it is you're doing, you need to think about how you're going to get someone to give you that opportunity. And what I started doing was on these studio films, I would get everyone together and I would try and bring everyone together at a weekend and say, OK, normally you're a third assistant director, but you want to be a first assistant director. Normally you're a camera trainee, but you want to be a cinematographer. You're a costume uh, costume trainee but you want to be a costume designer and I would bring together these groups of people all of whom were filmmakers starting out in their careers the same as me and I would say let's all work together on a short film let's just shoot for one day let's not spend loads of money let's make something to build up our experience and to build up our credits and the best thing you can do um, if you want your film to be good is to motivate the people working on it not just the crew, but also the cast. And I'll talk more about that in, in a moment. But ultimately, by giving other people an opportunity, I was giving them something as an alternative to money. I didn't have money to pay these people to work on my projects, but by giving them an opportunity to build their credits, they were up for working to help build my credits. And um, this notion of uh, motivating people and finding ways to motivate people is really key to progressing your career. So yeah, I started out in this realm of, of short films. And the great thing about short films is that they can be absolutely anything at all. They can be one minute long, they can be 20 minutes long, they can involve an enormous crew, or they can just be shot by you and your friend on your iPhone. Um, it's up to you. And there is really no excuse for not making stuff. We can all be making stuff all the time. We all have access to uh, equipment, um, that can be used like you know on an iPhone you can shoot a film at 4k that can be in a cinema ultimately um, maybe that's the right thing for your project maybe it's not but uh, if you're not getting opportunities then you need to create opportunities for yourself and the best way you can do that is to think about what are your strengths what do you have access to that other people don't um, I realized that I had access to a lot of crew. I knew a lot of people who were also starting out. And so I could bring those people together. I knew some actors who were starting out in their careers. I knew some actors who were having some success in TV. And I started to think, how can I bring these elements together? What do I have that other people don't? Um, I often use this example of like, if you have an auntie who has a horse, if you have a an uncle who has a fancy car, then include those things in your project. As you're putting together your script for your short film, 
Think about what you've got access to that isn't going to cost you any money and incorporate those elements because they raise the budget or they raise the, um, the production values of your project. You don't need to go and shoot your film in some faraway location. Um, if, if you're finding that your project is too expensive for you right now, then don't make it. Find a project that's right for you right now that involves people and toys and locations and props that you have access to. The other thing is that it's really easy to not notice what is on your doorstep. So living in London, I see these views every day of um, the Tower of London and St Paul's Cathedral and you take these things for granted and you think that everybody sees these things all the time and you forget that these things are visually quite interesting. And so if I shoot a film, a short film in London, um, I might be showing a bunch of things that are very familiar to me. But when I enter that film into international film festivals in Barcelona, in Australia, and on the other side of the world, they're gonna see those images and they're not used to seeing those places. So don't be surprised if sometimes the things that you have access to that other people don't are actually right on your doorstep and are much more evident than maybe you've realized. And yes, this is coming at things from a producer's perspective, but producers are there to make sure that films happen. Um, because if a film doesn't happen, nobody gains anything from it. And so if you're caught up trying to make a film that isn't happening, think about why that is, and is there a way of reconceiving it within the parameters that you do have access to? So this is a handful of the short films that I sort of got going. And very importantly for me, I started out with zero budget films, um, trying to make things with no money at all. Because if you can do something with no money and it looks good, then the more money that you add, the better your production values are gonna be and the cleverer you are gonna be from the outset because you know how to do it with nothing, the more funds, the more resources you have available, the better product you're going to create. Also, if somebody asked me now to produce a $50 million movie, that might sound quite exciting. And I might have broadly the skills to be able to do that, but I wouldn't want to do that. I'm gradually building up my experience. I've done the zero budget. I've done the very low budget shorts. I've done the good budget shorts. I've done the low budget features. I'm now doing these medium budget features sort of, of like four to $5 million. And I know I've got to do those before I do a $10 million film, before I do a $30 million film, before I do a $50 million film, because I need to build up my experience. And we should all always be looking to do this, to build up our experience gradually. Because if you get thrown in at the deep end, if you get asked to direct a $50 million film now, and it's a disaster and it goes wrong, that's the end of your career. Like it'll be a disaster, you'll have lost somebody a lot of money, and it'll be very hard for you to get work again after that. So do be really conscious and careful of um, overstretching and throwing yourself into water that's too deep. Think about what you're comfortable with and what you can do really well. Um, and if you can make shorts with uh, very little money, it's a good way of demonstrating to a potential financier that if they put money into your project, you are trustworthy and that you will be conscious of how that money is spent. So finding ways to motivate people, I touched on this a little bit earlier, but how do you get people to work on your projects when you don't have much money? What can you offer people? Well, if you've got money, you can offer people money. That's always a good way of motivating people. Everybody has um, rent and bills to pay. Um, so that's the easiest way of motivating people is with money. And that's what uh, established projects do. This is a film industry. And if we want to get paid to work in the film industry, we have to make a commercial product. If we're working on something that is gonna make some money, then everybody is motivated because hopefully if it makes some money, some of that money will go back to the people who were involved in the making of it. So if I can't offer people money, I need to offer them experience. I need to offer them an opportunity to um, progress their careers. Quite often when I'm making something, I'm doing so to progress my career, to try something new, to try working with some new people, some new equipment, maybe to try exploring a new story or a new format. So if I'm getting that, I need to make sure other people are getting that. 
And that means maybe not going to the people that you would expect to go to for the different roles. If you need a cinematographer and you're making something for a very low budget, great if you can find an established cinematographer to do it, but you will actually get much more energy and much more um, value out of somebody who is stepping up into that role than you will from somebody necessarily from somebody more established who doesn't stand to gain anything from working on your project. So you can also create a learning environment where people aren't just learning what they, they're doing, they're maybe also learning about some other different elements within the film that you are, are making. Short films especially, you have quite a small crew, you can have a small crew on a feature film too, but you need people to take on more responsibility. The bigger the film, the less responsibility each person has. And people are often motivated by trying new things, broadening their experience and taking on new responsibilities. So as I said, I'd worked on this film, Captain America, and I got to assist this uh, slightly grumpy looking man that is Mr. Tommy Lee Jones. And I learned a really important lesson while I was working with Tommy Lee. He is uh, not the happiest man in the world and uh, he takes great pleasure in being grumpy a lot of the time. And in spending some time with him, um, as I did uh, while we were filming over the course of uh, about three months uh, in, in and around London for Captain America, I realized that he was a bit bored with the opportunities that he was getting. And this was really interesting and this has really been key to my career kicking on. So I realized that Tommy Lee Jones was always getting cast in the same role. He always gets asked to play this grumpy army general who has to do the lines in exactly the same way. And you know what you're gonna get with him. You know if Tommy Lee Jones turns up in your film, whether it's Men in Black or Captain America or whatever, you know who he is going to be. And he always has to play the same character. And therefore he can, and because he's won and been nominated for all kinds of awards for playing that character, he can command a pretty massive fee for that. So if you're making a short film and you need a grumpy army general, don't call Tommy Lee Jones because you can't afford him and he's done it before and he doesn't want to do it again. But what this got me thinking about was that Tommy Lee Jones is desperate, like all actors, to show how capable they are. And so to take on roles that they wouldn't normally get. So if you've got a cross-dressing Spanish window cleaner in your film, maybe think about sending that script to Tommy Lee Jones and saying, hey, do you want to play this role? Because we've never seen you do anything like this and we trust you as an actor. Obviously don't send him that specific role, but like think outside the box with your casting because you can get fantastic people to come and work on your short films or your low budget or your independent films um, by being clever about your casting and by giving people opportunities to show what they haven't done before, not what they have done before. So a bit of a summary on short films. Generally, it's a director's platform. Directors need to have directed stuff in order to get features going. Um, the director stands to gain the most from a short film, but it's while it's not so great for producers, it's really useful experience. Um, and it's really useful as a tool to demonstrate that you are thinking in the right way as you're putting your project together, thinking about your audience. What is it that we are offering to the market here? Because if you're making a short film, it needs to be engaging or entertaining if it's going to win any awards or if you're going to get people to watch it online afterwards. You need to be entering into that contract with an audience saying, listen, if you watch this film, it'll be worth your while. And if you deliver on that contract, if you promise people that they'll have a good experience watching your film, and they do have a good experience watching your film, then those people will watch your film again. And that's what we all want. Like the goal in the film industry, whenever we make a film, is to be allowed to make another film. Um, if you just want to make one film and then you're done, then maybe this industry isn't for you. Or maybe you're an artist and you're going to make that one film and then you're going to go and do something else. So do think about that sustainability. If you make a film and it's a disaster, it's really hard to make another film. If you make a film that's uh, really good, but it loses a lot of money or it doesn't find an audience, then sometimes that doesn't work. 
And so that can prevent you from kicking on your career. So do be thinking about uh, where your film is going. So I've just seen there's a couple of things in the chat. So I'm gonna answer some of these questions. How can you get those kind of contacts? How can I work on those kind of productions? So starting in the film industry is, is the toughest thing when you have no contacts, when you have uh, no in. Um, but the easiest place to start is at the bottom. And there are a lot of opportunities all the time. Like there are other people's short films. There are other people's lower budget things. There are always people looking for people to volunteer and work for free. Um, and it is worth taking those opportunities. It's worth doing a little bit of the freebies, a little bit of volunteering to find the interesting people and to build those relationships. Um, yeah, finding those people from the outset can be tricky, but you'll find that with social media at the moment, I know this is something that uh, the Barcelona Film Festival has been really clued into, is getting everyone to connect on social media through Twitter and through Instagram and Facebook. You can now message almost anybody uh, in the world and uh, whether or not they'll engage with you is another thing, but you have that opportunity to find people's emails, email addresses or find their social media presence accounts and to contact them. Now, that doesn't mean that you should go to Jennifer Lawrence and Chris Evans and try and go to those people right at the top of their game. You should think about who's in your immediate network. If you live in uh, Ukraine, look at the filmmakers who are making the lower budget films in Ukraine, contact them, see if, if they are interested in working with you. If you've just seen a really good low budget film, don't necessarily message the director or the producer. Think about the production designer or the cinematographer. Message those people, say, hey, I just saw your film. I really enjoyed it. Um, say what you liked about it. Everyone in our industry is a sucker for flattery. As you guys know, you've made films. So you know that if somebody says something nice about your film, you're probably gonna take some time to talk to that person. Um, so yes, you can engage with people, but think about who you're engaging with and if they're likely to respond to you and try and pitch the right level. Think about people who live in the cities where you might be operating or make the sorts of films that you might be interested in. If you've done a bunch of horror films and you are looking to make a horror feature, think about people who are operating in that genre. Um, it's not worth sort of trying to get the attention of people who make films that are completely different to yours. So you're trying to capture people's um, attention who are in the sort of steps above you. I want to touch a bit on less is more. If you do a really short, short film that's really good, that is awesome because everything about it is good. Much better to have a short, really good film than a slightly longer film that's a bit rough because just people's perception of it is always going to be more positive. And if you have, uh, as I said, demonstrated consistent values and delivered a product at a high standard, delivered your film in such a way that people go, yeah, you can't fault this. This is really good. Um, it doesn't matter how long it is or how much money you spent on it. Doing something small and really good is really valuable. It's also worth thinking about because we have this social media, this, this small world uh, where anyone can find out anything about anyone else, Think about what information there is about you already online. So if you made some films that you're not proud of or that aren't very good, maybe try and take those things offline or make them harder to find. Try and make sure that if you've got good content, that is the first content that people find when they Google your name with the word film or with the name director or, or whatever it is you're trying to do. Because everybody, in our industry is constantly thinking about who is this person? How does the world see this person? Has this person got credits on IMDB? What is their profile within the industry? Am I dealing with somebody who's at my level? Are they more junior? Are they more senior? That sort of defines the, the relationships. So yes, and I cannot stress enough how important it is to continue watching films and low budget films from your area or from the genres that you're exploring, because you are looking for the next people. You are looking for the next talent, the great production designers coming through, the great cinematographers coming through. It's all very well you wanting to play a certain role on films, but you need to find the next generation and you need to 
try and latch onto those people before they become big and successful. Um, so where do these shorts go? When you're making a short film, or if you're making a feature film, you've got to think about why am I making this film? What's the plan? Where's it going to go? Um, and often that doesn't happen. Often we just make a short film and then we just see what happens. And that's not a good strategy. And that's not a sustainable business model. We need to be thinking, if I'm making this thing, how much is it going to cost me to make it? And how much is it worth in the marketplace? How much can I sell it for? And ideally, you need to be able to sell it for more than it cost, um, because that means that your investors will get their money back, hopefully with a little bit more, and that will let you make another film. If you sell it for less than it cost, your investors are not going to be happy. And sustaining that relationship, uh, and making more projects with them is going to be tough. So what's a producer? So on lower budget projects, I know that producers are maybe less active, but you guys need them more than ever. A producer structures a project, manages all elements of a project. And if there's an element that isn't working, the producer has to find a way to plug those gaps. So for me, having worked in lots of different departments, I need to know that if there's somebody not doing their job, that I can take over that job until we can find a replacement or that I can put a team together to cover the gaps uh, until our problems are solved. This is maybe a slightly uh, over-detailed thing, but this is the film value chain that just talks about the different stages of making a film. So a producer is one of the few people who is involved in this whole process, from finding a script, packaging a script, that means attaching cast, putting together the team to make it, raising the finance around that, running the pre-production while we finalize our budget and schedule when we get everything organized, through the shoot to post-production, through into the sales for the film, the distribution of the film as it goes to different countries across the world, the marketing, the exhibition is when it's actually going into cinemas, and then the recoupment, that money coming back in. And different people, um, different crew jobs, um, get involved at different stages of this process. And the vast majority of jobs are in this central production section. This is when the whole crew is together, all the cast are together and everyone is filming. And this is a very important section, but it's not the only section of what makes a film successful. You need to get this section, the development process right, to get a script that's in the best shape it can be, with the best cast that you can uh, afford, basically, with the financing that you're able to raise. If development doesn't go well and you don't have a good script, you don't have the good package at the start, it's really hard to shoot a good film if you don't have this good foundation, let alone deliver um, and exploit the rights. That sort of like the exploitation is the sales and the generating money from a film, whether it's a short or a feature. You need this section to go well and you need this section to go well and you need this section to go well. Right through everything has to, has to click for a film to be successful. And that's very difficult because there's a lot that can go wrong. There's so many different stages where someone can let you down or something can let you down. And the more times you go through this process, the more experience you have at solving problems. Really my job as a producer is to solve problems at each of these different stages. And by going through this process a number of times, I now know more people to help me solve problems at each of these turns. When you're starting out as a producer or a director, you can form alliances. You can work with other people. It's a collaborative medium. So if there's an area that you don't know much about, partner up with somebody, um, whether it's for the exploitation stage. Um, you know, for me, I really don't enjoy the fundraising and the financing side of things that is not where my skills lie. So I partner with people uh, to help me with that side of things. Um, I work with people who have the expertise that I don't have. There is no limit on how many people are involved in a project and therefore, uh, yeah, make sure you get the right people involved and that you plug the gaps. Sorry, I saw that there was a comment in the chat. Social media platform, do you recommend for a director? What social media is a good platform for a director? Is LinkedIn a good way to make connections? Well, ultimately, all social media is useful in that um, you want people to be able to find you and different people use different types of social media. 
I think that if you can get to a stage where you have your own website or if you're managing your own LinkedIn or Facebook page, think about how the world sees that. What content is there there? What content, um, what is that content saying to the world about you? That what is different about you to everyone else? This is also something really worth thinking about when you're making your short film. You're trying to do two very different things at the same time, and it's easy to forget this. You're trying to show that you know how to make a film in the traditional way, but you're also trying to show what's different about you and what's different about your style. And so these things are sort of often pulling against each other. You're trying to be distinct and have your own voice and show what it's like, um, what, what people will get if they hire you as a director or you as a producer, or you as a costume designer. But you're also trying to show that you know the established uh, patterns within the industry. So yes, do be involved across social media. There isn't one preferred area, but the more professional you look, the more chance you have that people will engage with you. Um, also, do be honest with your social media circle. Tell the world what you're looking for. If you're looking for a script, if you're looking for opportunities as a director or as a producer, put that on your Facebook, put that on your LinkedIn. Make sure that the people around you know what you're looking for because they will help you to find those things. And the chances are there are other people looking for someone like you. You might be a director starting out. There's out there, there's a producer starting out, maybe who lives on your street. Um, you know, you've just got to put as much information out into the world if you want the world to help you with your projects. Um, when you cast roles, do you consider their showreel CV or audition most? Are there any casting websites you prefer? Well, casting is always different on every project. Different projects have different needs, as you guys know. But do be conscious of what your showreels look like, whatever you're doing, whether you're an actor, a director, or, or whatever, a cinematographer. Make sure it's up to date. Make sure it shows your best work, because people will assume that um, that is all that you can do. Uh, whatever you have on your social media, um, you know, is a demonstration of, of who you are and what people will think of you. So if there's pictures of you looking terrible or not appropriate for the roles that you're casting for, try and bury those pictures, like be conscious of what's on your social media that's in the public domain. Okay, so next question, when starting your own studio or production company, what was your way to sell the projects to people? How do you choose what projects to produce? And what was the first film that you thought was a big movement in your career? Okay, I'm gonna answer that through the next few slides. Thank you for that convenient entrance. So having made some short films that have gone quite well uh, with budgets around sort of like 10 to $15,000. So not huge, but like enough money to pay some people something and to deliver some production values. My first feature film was a film called Narcopolis. Um, we had this rather snazzy poster. Um, this was a film that we made with a very small budget. Uh, and because I knew I couldn't afford big established people, um, I went to a film school and we hired a lot of people who just graduated from film school to give them their first feature. And we were able to um, pay people in such a way that we were paying them for the job, uh, however long the job took, where they agreed to, um, to work for a fixed fee for the job. And that's a way of of um, paying people appropriately when you're uh, building up their experience. So this was my first film. It was made with quite a small budget. I don't think actually, I'm actually allowed to say the budget, but um, it ended up looking really great. And because we delivered some really good production values with not very much money, um, it sort of kicked on. Unfortunately, Rotten Tomatoes did not take to the film and we got some pretty poor audience response to it, um, but that's okay. What's really important is getting up again and getting out there and having another go. So my first feature was called Narcopolis. It went okay. I think you can find it online somewhere. Um, but uh, yeah, picking the right project is really important. And when I started picking the right projects was really with this film called Copenhagen. And this is where I started to think about what do I have access to? What can I tap into? What is the right project for me to make? So this is a picture of my good friend, Gethin, um, who's one of my oldest buddies. I was at university with him and he's an actor and he's in Game of Thrones or he was in Game of Thrones 
But spoiler alert, he got killed in Game of Thrones. A lot of people die in Game of Thrones. If you haven't seen it, it's not a big spoiler. But Gethin played this very significant character who at the start of season two, he's Renly Baratheon. He's the king's he's sort of the gay character in that uh, second season of the show. And he gets killed pretty brutally at, uh, at, yeah, by Stannis Baratheon and Melisandre by a weird shadow fart thing that goes through his heart. Anyway my friend Gethin was suddenly a little bit famous. And so I thought, what project can I put together with my friend Gethin? And so I started talking to him. I was like, what do you need? How can I help you? Because I knew that if I could put together a project that was helping him, he would be willing to help me progress my career. And he said to me, Daniel, I'd really love to do something with an American accent because a lot of the roles in uh, TV are American accented roles. A lot of the money in Hollywood and in the film industry is in TV and American TV. So I started looking for scripts that featured a 20 something guy with an American accent. And I found this script for a project called Copenhagen through my network by literally asking out on social media for projects. And I started speaking to a writer director called um, uh, Mark Razzo. And um, we put together this project called Copenhagen. And uh, the film shot in Copenhagen, a pretty small cast, again, a character driven narrative about people and people's reaction to things. Ultimately, there's a really good idea at the center of this film. But if I tell you the good idea at the center of this film, I end up ruining a bit of the film. So because of that, the film was quite successful in festivals. In festivals, people will go and see a film without knowing much about it. But in the big bad world, to get people to part with money to go and see a film, you need to tell them why they need to watch your film. And if I tell you why you'll enjoy this film, it ruins a really important moment. There's like a turning point at the end of act one that if I tell you about it, you guys will go like, oh, cool. Yeah, I'll check that movie out. But the movie won't be as effective. But we got very lucky with Copenhagen and Netflix picked up the film and it played uh, on Netflix for three years and was very successful on Netflix in the US. And so my buddy Gethin uh, was playing this American accent role and uh, the film won um, the audience award at Slam Dance Film Festival and got fantastic ratings on Rotten Tomatoes. Audiences really responded well to it. And then my buddy Gethin got cast as Charles Manson in a TV show called Aquarius playing an American bad guy opposite David Duchovny and has gone on to uh, continue working uh, in the States. He's just been uh, in a series for Netflix called Manhunt, um, playing an FBI officer. And so he got what he wanted out of it and I got what I wanted out of it. I was able to make a low budget movie that got really good critical response and that kicked on my career because We'd made a successful film that we sold to Netflix that got some money back from my investors and that has helped me progress my career. I also happen to know this guy uh, who's a friend of mine called Harry Lloyd, who also got killed in Game of Thrones. What is it with that show? It just kills everyone who is dear to me. But my buddy Harry uh, got killed in season one very early. He was Daenerys' evil brother and he gets killed with molten gold. It's a pretty cool death, actually. But uh, I did another film. Again, he, Harry wanted an American accent role because he sort of heard what I was doing with Gethin. We shot a film called Big Significant Things. Um, Harry's just been in a TV show called Brave New World that's just come out on Sky and, and across lots of platforms across the world. And so he has really uh, kicked on his career as well, which is great. But we shot this low budget movie. I realized that TV actors are really keen to get into movies and to uh, raise their profile. This is our poster. Uh, the film played at South by Southwest and won the audience award there. So that was good. So when you're thinking about a film and when I came back to the UK, I put together a film called Burn, Burn, Burn. But these are the most important questions to ask yourself. What film can I make well? What film can I get financed? And what will making this film change? I'm going to skip through the next slides quite fast because I realize that this session is going to be really long if I do all the slides. But I'm just going to get to the end of this bit and then maybe we'll do a quick uh, Q&A so that we don't go too long past the hour. But think about these things. And if you can't answer positively or if you don't know the answer to these questions, find it out before you start. So this was a film called Burn, Burn, Burn that we made. I'd had success with my previous films having the guy 
from Game of Thrones. By having the guy from Game of Thrones, I had something to help sell my movie. I was giving that person something to help their career by putting them in a movie with an American accent. I thought this is working well. I should keep trying to do this. So this film, Burn, 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 stars Laura Carmichael, who was in Downton Abbey playing Lady Edith. And this was her first sort of big movie role. Um, this was her first contemporary character. It's her first lead. I knew that Downton Abbey was coming to an end and that uh, she was quite famous and that she would be looking to do something that was as different as possible to Downton Abbey. So this is a, a sort of a modern day road trip comedy about these two girls going on a road trip around the UK in this old uh, Volvo, uh, scattering their friends' ashes. Um, now, as we talk about this film, uh, I'm answering some of the questions. What film can I make well? Britishness. I'm in England. I've got access to British crew, British locations. What do we have access to that other filmmakers might not? Scale in the landscape is really valuable if you want your film to look big uh, and just not all be cooped up in a small space, then scale through the landscape is really key. Now, the advantages of a road trip movie. This is quite a clever one. So the simplest movie that anyone can make is two people in a room talking to each other. Um, that is like the basic premise for any sort of a story is some sort of interaction between different people and them reacting um, to the progressing narrative. Well, what is a car? It's essentially, it's a room. And so what I've done with road trip movies is I've got two people in a room, but that room then moves around the country and goes to different places. I'm going to different places, add scale, add scope and adds production value to my film. So I end up having a set that I own. The car in the movie is my car. It's parked outside. It even started today. Most days it doesn't start because it's quite an old car. But I started putting together a film around what I had access to and what I thought we could do really well. Small cast. Small cast saves you money, saves you logistics. Think about it. And then as you're on a road trip, we meet people along the way. So as we meet people along the way, each of those actors is just in for one or two days as we have these episodes as we move um, around on a road trip. Crew, who have I worked with on short films that is ready to step onto, onto features? Who is hungry? What will making this film change? Why am I making this film? Well, I want to develop relationships I want to demonstrate my skill as a filmmaker. Hopefully I want to be in some awards contention. I want to raise my profile. I want to demonstrate commercial sense. And that's the main goal is always for me to be able to make another film. So where is the money? It's worth thinking about where you might raise the money for a film. So for this film specifically, I knew that there was a, uh, money available in my country through the BFI to support underrepresented communities in the film industry. Now I'm not an underrepresented community in the film industry. I'm a sort of white middle-class male from England um, who speaks English. So I, there are lots of people like me in the film industry. So there isn't funding available specifically to help people like me. But if I partner up and if I try and make a difference by thinking about the racial, the age, the, um, the, the dynamics of the film that I'm putting together. Can I do something to address those imbalances in the film industry? Because if I am doing something, there is some money available or there are, I'm more likely to qualify for funding. If I partner with people uh, in a clever way and if I help progress people's careers from underrepresented communities. So this was all stuff that I was thinking about as I put the film together. Also, I looked at where there was funding available. There's a lot less funding available in London. Like in most countries, there's more funding available if you shoot regionally, if you get away from the town centres. So going on a road trip, we steered the road trip to go around those, um, around those uh, funding bodies. We literally went from London to Film Agency Wales, to Screen Yorkshire and to Creative Scotland, three big funding bodies within the UK. So we shot this film. I got uh, some people that I knew to be in it um, because we had some good people in it. We were able to attract some bigger actors to some of the other roles. We, uh, this is my old car, Betsy, we call her. Um, she's very dear to me. She's really the star of the show, although she wasn't paid properly. Um, yeah, we had some challenges along the way. Lots of things go wrong on a film set. Luckily, we've built up some experience. I'm not going to go into too much detail on 
what went wrong and some of the specific challenges, but uh, maybe we'll do that on another talk another time. But having some big shots, some big finale, we had a drone in for just, I think, two days on the whole shoot, but to get some big scale and some big adventure for some content to go in your uh, trailer. It's worth remembering that often it's a trailer that is selling your film. So think about what is in your trailer before you shoot your film. Where are the moments that you're going to spend most money? Where are you going to add the most value? So um, I'm just going to skip through these. And so, yeah, we did win a bunch of awards. Everything went pretty well. Uh, the film went to Netflix. Uh, the film changed the, the situation for a bunch of people. Uh, Chanya Button, the director, has gone on to do a couple of TV shows and did a much bigger feature called Vita in Virginia. Charlie Covell, the writer, she's fantastic. The first thing she wrote was Burn, Burn, Burn. The second thing she wrote was a TV show for Netflix called The End of the Fucking World. So that has gone very well for her. And I've gone on, I've been able to produce a few more movies since, which has been good. The film has a good rating on Rotten Tomatoes and has generally been pretty well received. So I've gone on to make some other films. Um, Dead in a Week is all available in Spain. So you should check that out if that's where you are. And um, I, yeah, seeing your film with posters in lots of different countries is really exciting. Hasn't had the uh, Rotten Tomatoes response that I'd hoped for, but I think if you check it out, you'll enjoy it. Um, I've then just made a film with uh, uh, this guy, Stephen Delane, also killed in Game of Thrones, and Kieran Hines, also killed in Game of Thrones. You can see I've got a bit of an addiction to guys in Game of Thrones um, because I love the show. Um, and we just made this film called The Man in the Hat, which is uh, out in cinemas in the UK and it's just come out in digital in the UK but it's available on more and more platforms now. I've had some really lovely reviews and that's going quite well. And then the trailer for my film, The Reckoning, just came out yesterday and that film is being released at the start of February, February 5th or February 6th, I think. But um, if you get a chance to check out my uh, website, it's rathergoodfilm.co.uk and uh, generally my brand is Rather Good Films. And so you can find me across social media platforms. Thank you so much. I'm sorry that I was quite so much talking always in these uh, talks and events, but I know there's some questions in the chat, so I'll try and answer those quickly, um, just as we wrap everything up. Independent documentary filmmakers. Well, documentary, I, I'm really sorry, I don't have any experience in documentaries. You'll find that the, the film world is quite separate between TV, film, um, and factual, uh, or sort of fiction and, and, and faction, uh, fiction and, and factual uh, material. But the best way to find uh, people is to look at films that you love, uh, and look at lower budget films that you love, look at who has worked on them, try and contact those people, try and find the companies doing the same sorts of things as you. Um, you should remember that if your film is a good idea and it's going to make money, then people will want to do it. And if your film isn't a good idea or isn't going to make anyone any money, it's going to be really hard to get it going on your own. It's just going to be an art project. Um, if you want to be part of a film industry, you need to be generating comment, uh, content that people want to pay for. If you're making a film that you wouldn't pay money to go and see in a cinema, you need to think about whether or not that's the right film for you to be making. Um, yeah, how do you find finance? Finance is the hardest thing. But if you do what I was just saying and you think about who is going to pay for this content, am I making something that people will pay money to go and see? It's really easy to forget the fact that it costs the same amount to go to the cinema to watch an Avengers movie that cost $150 million as it costs to go and watch my movie in the cinema, which maybe only cost one or $2 million. It still costs, I don't know, it's like £15 in London. So what experience are you going to offer to an audience? that is gonna make them want to part with their money. And it's worth thinking about, not just like if your film works, it's great if you do a great film and that everybody enjoys watching it, but you've got to find a way to get people to watch it. What is gonna be in your trailer? What's gonna be on your poster? Because if you can start helping a producer to answer those questions, that's the way to attract a producer. And that if a producer feels that your film is going to make money and it's going to be good and it's going to be successful, then they are going to want to work with you and you, will have, you won't have to keep asking for help. People will want to help you. So that's my big, broad, general advice. Think about the marketplace. Think about what audiences want. I wrote an article um, that you guys might have seen that was on the um, 
Barcelona International Film Festival website talking about optimistic content. I think we've had a really rough year in 2020. And I think that people now are turning to cinema for a bit of a release, a bit of a positive escape. So if you've got ideas for films, or projects brewing that are positive, now is the time to be doing those. If you've got some ideas for films that are a bit sad or a bit bleak, maybe save those a couple of years because I feel that the demand for content at the moment is very focused on trying to put 2020 behind us and to look forward to, to what's ahead. So, um, so yeah, so broadly, that's the end of my talk. And thank you so much for being so patient and for sending all of the questions so neatly. But if there are any more questions that people have that they want to ask now, um, yeah. do either chuck them on the chat or uh, message Sarah and she can ask me or unmute yourselves and say hello. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear Daniel. Uh, I mean, the time will never be enough to share all your experience. Uh, definitely starting a career in the film industry and keep it growing is not easy and there will be so many challenges ahead, but you need to look forward to them and, and learn from the experience. Really many, many thanks, dear Daniel. And we love that you could share your knowledge during this, uh, during this conference and really happy, happy birthday. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you very much and thank you as well to all of you uh, filmmakers for joining us today uh, during this conference. Thank you as well to Matthew, Graciela, Kate, Carlo, Albert, Floris, Uwe, Anastasia. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much to the Barcelona International Film Festival for having me. And, um, and you guys will need to remember, everyone who's listening to this talk, that it's really important to share information, that people want to share information, and that hopefully as your careers progress, do think about other people who are developing around you. And the more that you help other people, the more that other people will help you. And that's a good sort of positive message to launch us into 2021. Um, but thank you again for having me. My name is Sara Plasencia, and this is the Barcelona International Film Festival. Thank you very much.